Okay, welcome to Temple University Japan. I'm Robert Desarig from ICAS. Uh, without further ado, I will thank all the participants and I will give the floor to our friend and moderator, John Lewis, who will introduce the panel. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you very much, Robert, and to ICAS and Temple University. And my name is John Lewis, and uh, I'm a visiting scholar this semester at Tokyo, Gay, Tokyo Gakugei University here in Tokyo um, and on LGBT issues and marriage equality. And uh, my husband and I were uh, our long-term activists for marriage equality in the United States and were plaintiffs in the 2000 to 2004 to 2008 marriage equality litigation. So um, today we have a very special opportunity to learn about the latest developments uh, regarding LGBT rights uh, and the status of queer people in China, Singapore, and Taiwan, and learn that directly from leaders in those three countries who have been instrumental in bringing about that historic change. Uh, as many of you may know, Taiwan in 2019 became the first country in Asia with marriage equality. And in Singapore, uh, the LGBTQ community achieved a major breakthrough uh, just this past August um, when the Singaporean government announced that it would finally repeal Section 377A, the law with British colonial roots um, that criminalized sexual intimacy between men. And in recent years, the LGBT community in China uh, has made tremendous strides yet in the last couple of years uh, has faced considerable challenges because of uh, a state crackdown on LGBT rights uh, in the midst of an increasingly repressive political atmosphere. So today we are very fortunate to have with us Victoria Xu, a longtime leader of the LGBT rights movement in Taiwan, who with her team were lead attorney in many uh, LGBT rights cases in Taiwan as well, including the 2019 historic marriage equality uh, litigation. We have Remy Chu and Suang Wijaya, two of the lead attorneys in the litigation challenging section 377A in Singapore. And we're generally our leaders uh, of great influence in the Singaporean LGBT movement. And finally, Peng, Peng Yangwei and uh, Guang uh, Yang Guanchen uh, from China. Uh, and um, Peng is co-founder and former director of LGBT Rights Advocacy China, um, a cutting edge impact litigation and advocacy organization uh, that unfortunately was forced to shut down uh, last November. And uh, Yang is the former project manager of LGBTQ Rights Advocacy China and director of the China Rainbow Media Awards. So thank you for every, to everybody for your participation and for all of uh, everybody for being here. And we're gonna have 20 minute presentations about each country, uh, then followed by time for discussion and question and answer. So I'd like to begin with the current situation in China. So Yang and Peg, I will turn it over to both of you. Uh, one second. I will open my slide. Uh, could everybody see it? Yes. Ah, thank you so much. Uh, hello, my name is Guang Qingyang. I'm a, a manager of LGBT rights advocacy. It's the first LGBT advocacy group in China. And in the past uh, eight years, we focus on the litigate. We have launched uh, many litigations that covered different LGBT issues in China, such like cancer therapy, discrimination in workplace, and same sex couple protection. So now I'm here, I'm going to give a little bit information about the current situation and LGBT advocacy in China with my colleague and also my husband, Jens. Now, um, so first of all, I would, I would, I would like, I'd love to give everybody a little inf in, uh, information about how we identify ourselves in China. Normally in China, especially for millennials, we don't call ourselves like gay or lesbian or bisexual. 
commonly we call ourselves comrade. It's not because we live in a community societies, but we use this identity to address, to highlight actually the revolutionized meaning and the political meaning of ourselves in this country. So I'm not sure, is there anybody in, in, in this lecture have any kind of information or idea about communist therapy? Or I, I, I was wondering like anybody used to experience communist therapy in your own country? Um, in 2013, at that, at that time, many people from our community reached out to us and said that, and think that they experienced convincing therapy because they get pressure from their family or from themselves. So um, we also want to encourage some people to stand up and talk to media that, to express like what kind of horrible experience they had in China. But at that, at that moment, nobody dared to stand up out saying that I'm a victim of convincing therapy. So uh, for addressing these issues, my husband voluntarily took go to a clinic in uh, Chongqing, a small, a big city in central China, experienced convincing therapy, electronic shock. So um, after that, we sued this clinic to the court and it, and then it become the first LGBT Q impact litigation in China. And also the result was very positive. During the verdicts, it's very clear the judge said um, homosexuality is not a disease. It's not disease. It's the first time that in the official document in China that specifically addressed that LGBT is being LGBT is not a disease or mental illness in China. And so it's become the start of our work that use the education, use the legal action to improve our living situation in China. And after that, this case is really become really influential cases in China that we have interviewed by many state-run media, like media on CCTVs or some very popular newspaper and magazines. I bet it talks that because it's, it's the time that people realize that common therapy is real that exists in China and it could cause a very damaged result to LGBTQ individuals. And we also, after this case, we feel like more and more people reached to us and said, oh, also, I also had this kind of bad experience and I want to talk to the media. It feels like this case could start something that make people believe legal action could be a true or could be a way that to prove their legal situations. But after we, do after finished this case, we still find like the common therapy is everywhere. We do a very small survey in China, it feels like in 2016, we still find like over 1,000 hospitals and clinics that provide common, a mixed styles common therapy to the LGBT individuals. Even within the cases, even many media talk about these cases, but this case is haven't changed the law or changed the system. Even now people have the awareness that it's, it's not true. It's illness, it's not true, it's so bad that we don't have any law or policy to ban it. So you can see this photo uh, on, in the life. In, two, in 2016, a gay man which lived in Zhuma Jie, a now city in China. He was sent, he was sent by, he was sent to to the local uh, mental health hospitals by her ex-wife and the family-in-laws. And she stayed in this uh, mental illness hospitals for 19 days. And eventually we and another activist helped her, him to escape from the hospitals. And also he sued the hospital and won the cases, but we still find the conservative practice aware. Even now it seems like no clinic there to openly say that we provide constant therapy, but it's on the survey is still ongoing. I think the common therapy case is, is just an example of what our living situation in China. I think in China, so far there's no any law or any policy or any governing body that responds, responds to the LGBT issues. So in another word, they're empty for us, or I will ignore the ditched by the by the, the whole system. And uh, also in China, I think many people, many LGBT individuals, they 
get a very high pressure from the family because the family centric culture in China and also the, the, heritage, the heritage of the Confucianism. Because the, the one of the core principles of Confucianism is manner. In China, we call it Li. Li actually is, it means social order. Men do men things, women do women things, king do king things, and uh, people do people things. But if you don't stick up to your role, like straight, you broke you broke the, the principles, and everybody were going to ditch you or going to attack you. So on the left, we is there is a graph from uh, UNDP China. UNDP China, and you can see that actually many people still keep their sexual orientation identity in schools, in families, or in their workplaces. There's a very tiny percentage of people that openly talk about their sexual orientation, their gender identity, or their gender expressions. So since we since, uh, since 2013, we have launched certain impact litigations, and it's covered a lot of different issues like conversation therapy, and also we do the litigation about the textbooks, and also about the HIV related to discrimination in workplaces, and also um, some cases about the cup, the same sex couples' rights, and when we win some of them. Every time when we sued the private sectors, we win the cases. But when we sued the government departments, we just lost the cases. So it sounds like a bit bad, but yeah, we still win some of them. So far, we still have three litigations ongoing, and we, we don't know what will happen in the future, but we, we will see what will happen. So, um, so um, OK. So, when we are launching our applications, we also do a lot of things, like we write a lot of articles to talk about and media release to talk about what happened in China, where we would like to highlight this kind of information and what kind of rights behind this kind of legal actions. We, would, we use these articles to give our community and give scholars and stakeholders some ideas like why this matters and why we want to have legal protections. You can see this kind of photo is some of the example uh, articles we have done before. And also besides that, we also mobilize a lot of people to protest in the front of the courthouse. Like we ask, the, we invite the volunteers and the lawyers to protest in the front of the house. You can see the photo on the left. And also we have launched a lot of unlike uh, advocacy campaigns that call for people to comment on the certain issues or cases and give the price keep keeping give the pressure to the government and also we have done a lot of training workshops with law professionals lawyers and the law school students to talk about the LGBT issues and how they can uh, contribute to our movement or become the part of the movement we feel, we feel it's very successful so far we've got 150 lawyers joined our network that provides free legal aid to the needed LGBT individuals. And also doing, and in, the, in 2019, at that time, China was going to long, we're going to release the first civil court and, uh, and, and call for the online co comments from this court. So we also launched, organized a legal, uh, legal campaign as call for people to, uh, I uh, sent home and uh, we launched a campaign online that asked people to submit their opinion to the Chinese government that asking uh, Chinese government to put the same sex marriage in our first uh, civil court. And after you can see that actually many people joined this campaign and we have um, 180,000 people, mostly uh, LGBT individuals. They submit the comments on opinions that ask trans government to add same sex marriage in the civil code. And after that, doing a media conference, a spokesman from uh, Fa Gongwei, a high legislative working body, they responded to the journalists and things like we do received a lot of comments ask us to put same sex marriage in civil code. This is the first time in our history that such higher government bodies talk about same-sex marriage, in, even in a very neutral way, but it still feels like it creates some visibility for us. 
in 2020, we started to do uh, new cases about lesbian couples, custody cases. And this is very important for us. So basically this case is about two Chinese lesbians. They get married in the United States and they have a twins in the United States. Went back to China, they just split up. One, one lesbian took off, out, took off the trains, and now we support another fightful share the custody. So this case is very important for us because it's bring us a new, some new thoughts, like how should we start our litigation? How should we shift our uh, strategies in China? Because normally when we talk to the legislators and talk to some, some officials, like something like LGBT equality or same-sex same sex marriage, it more feels like the social issues. But when we do custody, the lesbian couples custody cases, it's become a legal issues because we already have a lot of law talk about the, how to deal with custody for straight couples. We already have the system to protect them. Now we just break them down, just break, uh, we just make the same, same sex uh, marriage down into some small legal issues in China under the China legal legal system like custody and shared properties and insurance. We use that as a strategy to break the barriers we are facing in China. So far, this case is still ongoing. Even it happened two years, but we're still waiting for the result. So as I mentioned before, I talked about I talked about that we have to a lot of legal actions before, but now it feels like more, we received more and more pressure from Chinese government. In 2000, since 2020, like many schools, many small grassroots organizations, their social media account was vanished by Chinese government. And also our organization was suspended because we received a lot of pressure from local authorities. And also we select, it's not the isolated cases and actually many LGBTQ organizations in China are facing um, backlash not just from the authorities, but also from societies. At the end, I put a summary table there about, I think it can give more information about to our audience, like what kind of protection we already have in China or what kind of rights we haven't got in China. So for example, like for the same sex, sexual activity, yes. And equal age of consent, yes. And anti-discrimination law in employment, no. But for transgender workers, if they have uh, gender confirming surgery, they will be automatically uh, protected under trans law because they, they just become the binary. And also, we don't have any anti discrimination laws in education sector or, and, or other areas. And also for recognition of same sex couples, uh, no, so far we haven't. We haven't got any law or any policy protect us. But under the civil code, we have the new law called guardianship. This means like same-sex couples, they can find someone to become the guardian when they become uh, incapable. Now it's become very common in China that same-sex couples use the, the voluntary guardianship to protect themselves in some extremely dangerous situation, like when they have big, when they have disease, dis diseases or when they become accident, the experience some accident, something like that. And also for uh, the rights to change legal gender, yes. And if you want to change your gender on your, some all the legal documents like your, um, your ID or like your education uh, degree certificate, also you can change that, no problem. And also I would have for lesbian couples, no, but now I think Chinese legal system is discussing about to give the rights for the single females to, access IVF service, and also for the commercial surrogacy for same-sex couples is still banned and illegal. But in practice, this kind of service is still easily accessible. And now I, Jens, uh, do you want to add something? Uh, okay, so basically the general idea is we don't have any laws and regulations specifically talk about LGBT. That's why when organizations raise the visibility in society, so our organization's strategy is to raise the visibility in law. So we uh, bring the litigation, mobilize the community and media or to, to raise the discussion. What's the problem of the 
what's the institutional uh, problem, lack of legal protection on that. So that's how we work on litigation, lawyers network and this kind of media campaign. But as Yang Yi said, since 2020, civil society become a very uh, big sensitive topic, topic uh, for the government. So we face different kinds of uh, pushback. So uh, we don't know how to move in forward for the next step. Yang, please. Okay, uh, I'm going to end my presentation <laughs> here. So thank you, everybody. And I guess thank if you. you have any questions, we can discuss discuss it in the Q and A part. So thank you so much. And also, I put our email address there. If you have any question, please directly reach out to us. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, uh, Yang and uh, Peng, for that uh, really, really interesting and educational presentation. Um, and uh, uh, they will also put their contact information in the chat uh, uh, later so that you have it. And also, if people do have questions uh, as the presentations are being made, you can feel free to put those in the chat um, as uh, those questions come to your mind. And we'll also, we'll deal with that uh, later after the presentations. So uh, now I want to, uh, turn things over to uh, Swang and Remy to uh, give us an overview and update of where things stand in Singapore. So um, uh, welcome, and uh, why don't you go ahead and take it from here. Thank you. Uh, I will start first uh, for 10 minutes, uh, focusing more on legal developments. And then Remy will touch more on the advocacy and activism uh, aspects. So if I may just share my uh, simple slides. Okay. Uh, do we see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I was just quite amazed just now to see some of the, um, you say limited, but um, at least some protections that you see in uh, Chinese law with respect to uh, various aspects. Um, things, if you, say, if you say in China, things are more uh, limited, uh, they are even more so in Singapore. So uh, in terms of uh, the general overview of uh, rights related to uh, the LGBT community, uh, my first bullet point says no explicit protection. That means uh, we just have a general uh, equality clause in the constitution that just says all shall be entitled to equality before the law. And then we have a more specific clause that says there shall be no discrimination on the basis of a few uh, explicit grounds. Uh, it includes uh, race, religion, place of origin. It does not include gender. So gender discrimination is not a constitutional um, right. Uh, it does not definitely include, uh, certainly it doesn't include sexual orientation uh, in, the, in relation to discrimination. So there's no explicit uh, constitution. Uh, there are just statements by the government that uh, there would be discrimi no discrimination in the, in the workplace uh, or elsewhere, uh, but uh, again, no explicit law. Uh, we have this latest uh, maintenance of religious harmony uh, amendment bill, uh, which was seen as quite a significant development, although it's actually quite a low threshold. Basically, it's saying, uh, you know, it shall be an offense for somebody to be advocating force or violence against a specified group and that include LGBT group. So yeah, it's now an offense to advocate violence against LGBTs. So pretty low threshold, um, but I mean, we see it as a development still. Uh, with respect to criminalization itself, and I, I guess the developments, uh, why we were in such a restricted state was really because uh, in the law, at least, or the law books, uh, same-sex intimate activity between males was only until, in fact, it still is until today, uh, an offense. Uh, so what we had here, uh, if you see at the left, is 377. Uh, this law was in place all the way until 2007. Uh, this 377 on the left actually criminalizes all uh, intimate 
sexual activity uh, that is not procreative in nature. So in fact, uh, obviously that criminalized uh, acts between women and uh, quite interestingly, that used to criminalize uh, non-procreative activity between heterosexual, hetero, uh, I mean a uh, straight couple. So there used to be a court case which everybody used to um, joke about, the lawyers used to joke about, where the actual holding by the Court of Appeal was, oh, uh, a straight couple, uh, it's an offense for a straight couple to have oral sex unless the oral sex leads to procreative sex. So uh, that's the status of 377. Uh, then we had 377A, which is a much, uh, which was enacted uh, about 50 years after the original uh, 377. So 377A is targeted uh, directly at males only and uh, essentially uh, any intimate activity between males uh, is an offense. Uh, so that was what uh, I had talked about earlier. So we had 377. So then what happened was uh, we had a 2007 uh, very comprehensive review of uh, the criminal law in Singapore, it touched on all aspects of the criminal law. And uh, one of the major debates in Parliament was in relation to 377 and 377A. As for 377, which as we saw just now was the even more anachronistic provision, uh, Parliament and government said, let's, uh, let's go and uh, repeal that because that's so anachronistic, that's so archaic. You know, how can we, how can we uh, prohibit uh, straight couples from having uh, uh, oral sex and all? So they repealed that. And as a result of repealing that, of course, uh, all the non-procreative sex between straight couples became legalized formally. And then, uh, of course, uh, same-sex activity between women became legalized. Uh, however, they decided to retain 377A, which was targeted uh, directly only at uh, men. Uh, during the parliamentary debates, uh, statements were put forward by members of parliament and uh, government ministers to say that uh, they needed to retain 377A uh, as a, again, a bit to, to because this uh, comports with the majoritarian or, or the societal mores of Singapore society. Uh, but what they promised was that there will be no proactive enforcement of this law. Um, of course, there's a question of what proactive enforcement means, but that's the promise. Uh, we then had uh, initial litigation. So there was an initial litigation that lasted between 2010 to 2014. Uh, what happened there was this gentleman, uh, which is Mr. Tan Eng Hong, uh, he was, in fact, uh, uh, he actually committed fellatio in a public toilet in a shopping center and uh, he got complained against and he was arrested. Uh, he was actually initially uh, investigated and then charged under 377A. And then his solicitors then, uh, Mr. M. Ravi, uh, acted for him and intimated that he would challenge the constitutionality of Section 377A. And then what happened was the prosecution then amended the charge from 377A to a gender-neutral gender charge, which is merely public indecency. And then the prosecution said, uh, you cannot, uh, you have no legal standing, you have no local standi to challenge the constitutionality because you are no longer, uh, you are no longer uh, charged under 377A. So it becomes a wholly uh, hypothetical exercise. That went up to the Court of Appeal. Uh, the Court of Appeal is actually the highest court in Singapore in 2012. And the Court of Appeal handed down a victory for Mr. Tan, at least a procedural victory by saying that Mr. Tan did have the standing to challenge the constitutionality. Uh, there were two main reasons. Number one was uh, that Mr. Tan was actually arrested, investigated, and detained pursuant to 377A, even if he was not eventually uh, charged under 377A. And on that basis alone, he had legal standing. Uh, but then the Court of Appeal actually put forward a much uh, broader ruling, which is to say, even if he had not been detained, arrested, or investigated under 377A, uh, under the law, his very status as a member of the community and the very existence of the 377A in the books, even if there's a promise of no, no proactive enforcement, gives him standing to challenge. 
Uh, so that paved the road to um, really members of the LGBT community just uh, having the standing to challenge, even if they had not uh, undergone what uh, Mr. Tan did. Uh, what then happened was, of course, for Mr. Tan, it went forward to the substantive uh, constitutional challenge. Uh, and then we had another team, which is uh, Mr. Lin Meng Suang. Uh, uh, Remy uh, was uh, the lawyer for Lin Meng Suang as well. So there was uh, Mr. Tan's challenge and Mr. Lim's challenge, all uh, running concurrently. Uh, and that ended up with a 2014 uh, Court of Appeal decision. Uh, it was a very disappointing decision. And I think every, almost all legal commentators recognize it today, judges, everybody recognize it today to be a extremely poorly reasoned decision. So it, it dismissed everything and basically uh, was very dismissive in tone and it just said, uh, all your arguments are not legal in nature. They are all just emotional and political. So uh, so uh, very badly reasoned decision. Uh, so uh, uh, before this slide, there had been, uh, I should give a bit of background. Uh, what then happened was that, if you also recall, the 2014 Lim Beng Suang uh, 2014 decision coincided around the same time as the 2013-2014 decision by the Indian Supreme Court, uh, which uh, essentially reached almost the same result as Lim Beng Suang, dismissing everything. Uh, and then around 2018, uh, the Indian Supreme Court actually overruled that 2014 decision. And uh, the Indian Supreme Court said that uh, 377, which was uh, what I was talking about earlier, 377 was unconstitutional under the Indian Constitution. So uh, uh, with that in mind, uh, we had uh, two sets of uh, plaintiffs, again, in, uh, in Singapore, uh, re-challenging uh, the correctness of Lim Beng and re-challenging 377A. Okay? And uh, so that litigation commenced around the third or fourth quarter of 2018. Uh, in response to that litigation, in October 2018, uh, the Attorney General, who is the public prosecutor in Singapore, uh, issued this statement, uh, which reiterated what the government and parliament said in 2007 and said, oh, in the case of 377A, when the conduct is between two consenting adults in private place, absent other factors, uh, prosecution will generally not be in the public interest. Uh, that went to the High Court at first instance in 2020, in 2020 and the High Court uh, initially just affirmed Lim Beng Suang in all its totality. Uh, of course, uh, all the plaintiffs appealed. Uh, by now, there were three sets of plaintiffs. So uh, one set of plaintiffs was uh, uh, Remy's firm, one set of plaintiffs is uh, my firm, and the third set of plaintiffs was uh, Mr. Ravi. Uh, it went up to Court of Appeal, and uh, Court of Appeal actually did this uh, a bit of a punt, uh, I suppose a bit like what the US Supreme Court uh, has, been, uh, has been doing with LGBT cases. So they did a bit of a punt, uh, they said, uh, we won't decide the substantive issues. Uh, they say, as a result of the promises made by government in 2007 and the promises made by the Attorney General in 2018, uh, we elevate those promises into a legally enforceable undertaking such that it would now be legally, uh, the prosecution would be legally not allowed to commence prosecutions because of the doctrine of legitimate expectations. And therefore, since there's no real prospect of you getting prosecuted, because now uh, the Attorney General and prosecu public prosecutor is legally prohibited from prosecuting you, uh, therefore, you no longer have standing, and therefore, we will not decide the questions. Uh, so that was a bit unsatisfactory. Uh, but then they did make some comments regarding the uh, regarding whether 377A would pass master under the Equality Clause, which seems to suggest that if they had to decide a substantive issue, they would have he did say that it was unconstitutional. Following the decision, uh, this was, and this is really fresh news. It was just uh, about uh, six weeks ago. Uh, we had this situation where, uh, I suppose it's not parliament announcing, and uh, it hasn't gone to parliament yet. The legislation uh, hasn't been put forward yet, but it's more government announcing. So the government has announced that they will put forward a bill in Singapore to repeal uh, 377A. And one of the stated reasons was that, oh, uh, they would, uh, they felt that there was a real risk that if uh, the litigation had indeed uh, gone ahead, there's a fourth litigation, uh, there would be a real risk that a court of appeal in a future case might actually strike down the legislation as uh, unconstitutional. Uh, they say the court of appeal sort of uh, gave a chance here to let parliament do uh, what is right. So they decided to repeal. 
Uh, but at the same time, they say that, uh, you know, we we don't want this situation where there's multiple constitutional challenges with respect to same-sex marriage. So now what they will do is uh, they will put forward another bill to also amend the constitution uh, to say that parliament shall have full power to decide on the issue of the definition of marriage and that such uh, definition of marriage uh, as enacted by parliament will not be subject to constitutional challenge. So that is the current status. And I think uh, it will be a good time now for uh, Remy to take over. Thanks, Wang. Uh, I'm going to try and share screen. Uh, and I'm just going to very quickly outline some of the social movements that have moved in parallel to the legal challenges. So uh, in addition to the uh, legal challenges uh, that I had the uh, uh, honor of participating in uh, in 2013 as well as 2019, uh, concurrent to that, uh, there were several social movements that uh, the community was organizing uh, that tried to help uh, uh, Singaporeans more generally understand uh, what the problem with a law like 377A uh, was. Uh, and uh, we think eventually set the stage for the government uh, deciding to repeal 377A. Uh, I think I uh, preface my discussion by uh, apologizing to all my colleagues for what uh, must seem like an unhealthy fixation with a single issue. Uh, and indeed, over the last 15 years of the uh, campaign to repeal 377A in Singapore, uh, it must have seen, uh, seemed to everyone in Singapore or internationally that the only thing the gay community, uh, the LGBTQ community in Singapore was obsessed with was this uh, law that prohibited sex between men. Uh, and, and, and so unfortunately, I think that leads to uh, what must look like um, a state of arrested development in uh, our uh, equality movement here. Uh, and it's really only now after uh, repeal uh, has been um, confirmed by the government or is about to be confirmed by the government that I think we're going to be able to uh, start talking more systemically uh, about all the other issues that uh, the community faces uh, beyond 377A that uh, Yang has been talking about in uh, China. So uh, against that backdrop, um, this photo here you see is uh, a photo of uh, Ping Dot that's ha held every year in July in Hong Lim Park, a free speech corner in Singapore, uh, where uh, anywhere between fifteen to 20,000 people turn up to celebrate uh, the freedom to uh, love equally regardless of uh, sexual sexuality or uh, gender. Uh, this is a uh, movement started in 2009. Uh, it's been going on every year since then, uh, and I think uh, it first started with a few hundred people in Hong Lim Park, and now every year it draws about fifteen to 20,000 Singaporeans from uh, all walks of life. Uh, this was the Ready for Repeal movement that was started in 2018 after the Indian Supreme Court judgment. Uh, after the Indian Supreme Court judgment uh, reading down Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, uh, Singaporean uh, activists and lawyers started debating and discussing whether or not to start a new set of legal uh, challenges. Uh, before that and concurrent to that, uh, community organizers uh, got together and we decided to uh, run a, a public campaign uh, to ask for repeal. Uh, so uh, apart from the 40,000 signatures we gathered, we also uh, geolocated uh, all the signatures based on constituency uh, and we got constituency representatives from the community and allies to bring uh, those signatures uh, and the reasons to ask or appeal to uh, members of parliament uh, in uh, each constituency. Uh, I just wanted to give you a brief uh, thumbnail sketch of uh, the demographics of religion uh, and religiosity. I think 
what I've done is highlighted the two community uh, groups uh, or religious uh, groups that are most strongly opposed to uh, LGBTQ equality. Uh, it's the Christian community, it's the uh, um, uh, Islamic community. Uh, Christianity is 18.9% of the population that includes 7% Roman Catholic and 11.9% uh, uh, Protestants. Uh, Islam uh, comprises about 15.6%, but in the discourse on uh, retaining 377A and holding back LGBTQ uh, equality, I think they have the loudest uh, voices. Uh, uh, I'm just going to very quickly trot through snapshots of where we are uh, uh, now in 2022. This is a recent uh, study. Uh, you will see that the uh, issue of repeal, uh, strongly support, somewhat support, is the strongest amongst uh, 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 year olds. Uh, so support for repeal, uh, it commands a plurality more than 50%. Uh, 50%. It's 62% in both the 18 to 24 and 25 to 34 year old categories. Uh, it, it drops off sharply once you go to the 35 to 49 and 50 years old uh, and above categories. So that is uh, the uh, support for the repeal of 377A. Okay. Uh, the question of gay marriage, again, uh, what we where we are now in uh, Singapore LGBTQ equality is in a very strange warp speed scenario where after 15 years of talking about just decriminalization uh, because of the constitutional amendment around uh, enshrining marriage between a man and a woman, uh, immediately the community is forced to reckon with or uh, being asked to uh, grapple with the question of uh, gay marriage immediately, uh, whether or not to have it enshrined uh, as a prohibition in the constitution. And uh, so the question is being asked now, do you personally support gay marriage? Again, you can see uh, very hopefully, uh, 18 to 24, 62% uh, are for it. Uh, 25 to 34, uh, again, uh, a simple majority for it. Uh, it drops off considerably once you go uh, past the 35-year-old mark. So uh, again, uh, a lot of cause for hope, uh, but equally, uh, a lot of cause for concern because uh, at the same time, repeal is going to be passed in Parliament. There will be a constitutional amendment to uh, uh, shore up the definition of marriage as between a man and a woman, or at least a reference to the existing definition uh, in the Women's Charter, if not an outright constitutional amendment, uh, that is going to make gay marriage uh, all but impossible by way of public impact litigation. Uh, and so uh, you will see very strangely uh, that the question of this enshrining of a definition between a man and a woman is not very well understood because uh, effectively it will uh, prohibit uh, trying to obtain gay marriage through the courts the way it's been done in the US and in India. Uh, so if you look at the previous uh, question, do you support gay marriage? 62% of 18 to 24 year olds support it. But if you look at the constitutional decision or decision to define marriage as only being between a man and a woman, very strangely, if you look at 18 to 24-year-olds, 59% uh, uh, of 18 to 24-year-olds strongly support or somewhat support. So that's the first uh, left-hand column. 26% uh, and 33% strongly support and somewhat support uh, enshrining marriage as only between a man and a woman. So that's about 59% that are actually okay with an amendment to enshrine marriage as only between a man and a woman. Uh, and you can see those numbers uh, increase significantly. That means uh, enshrining marriage as only being between a man and a woman uh, between the ages of 35 uh, to 49 and 50 years, years old and above. So I, I think the, the only conclusion that uh, can be drawn at this point in time 
uh, in respect of the immediate question that will be before Parliament uh, as early as this month or next month, is that the issue of enshrining or the implications of enshrining uh, the definition of marriage as being between a man and a woman, uh, more broadly speaking, is uh, less than perfectly uh, understood. Uh, and its implications on uh, what that means for gay marriage. So uh, I, I think uh, Singapore has exceeded its uh, time limit for the panel discussion. I'm uh, happy to hand the time over, I think, next to Taiwan. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Remy and Swang. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, very, very interested in your presentation. So, um, yeah. So how about without further ado, uh, we uh, travel a little bit and head to Taiwan. And uh, Victoria, welcome, and uh, please uh, go ahead and proceed. Uh, and you should have the ability to share your screen if you uh, I have slides to share too. Good morning, everyone. I'm Victoria Xi, and I'm co-founder of Taiwan Alliance to promote civil partnership rights, and also a uh, Taiwanese attorney, yeah. And um, in 2017, our legal team has represented Mr. Qi Jia Wei to win the marriage equality case in our constitutional court. Okay, um, can you hear me? Okay, okay. And um, the grand justices said that um, not allowing same-sex couples to get married is unconstitutional and um, give our parliament two years to amend relevant laws. Yeah, so that's why we uh, have the same-sex marriage law in uh, 2019, yeah. And, you know, but actually this is a uh, um, um, three decades battle for our client, Mr. Qi Jia Wei. He has uh, petitioned our government in uh, 1986, which was under martial law. Yeah, to legalize uh, same-sex marriage. And back then our government um, insulted him actually, said that um, homosexual people um, look, pursue only for satisfaction of sexual desire. And this is a, a violate, homosexuality is, is violation to uh, public order and uh, good morals. So um, it, it would not be allowed for same-sex couples to get married. Yeah, that's the situation in uh, um, 1986, yeah. And, and then I have grown up and to be his lawyer, yeah. So uh, in uh, 2017, we won the case but before we won the case in constitutional court, we have um, introduced um, same-sex marriage, marriage equality bill to the parliament in uh, 2013, yeah. Um, the TAPCPR team has drafted a bill and uh, um, we, uh, we, we send the bill to the parliament. But uh, after one month of the first reading, the, the anti-gay churches, they uh, mobilize a lot of people on street to protest. And then the politicians um, were afraid of losing votes. So the bail was shelved basically. Yeah, and uh, in 2016, again, we introduced the bail to the parliament. And, but, but, but again, yeah, the, the political struggle and uh, all the things, the debate it going on and then um, so very fortunately that Taiwan has independence of the judicial system. So our constitutional court took our case and made decision. That would be the key factor uh, to legalize same-sex marriage in Taiwan, I think. And of course we have, you know, the, uh, the freedom of speech and uh, the right to assembly and uh, yeah, et cetera, yeah, which helps too, because we can, uh, you know, um, freely discuss LGBT issues uh, in society and that promote the dialogue and improve the uh, social acceptance, et cetera, yeah. And, you know, uh, after the passage of our same-sex marriage law, the government, uh, has conducted the uh, survey uh, towards the public uh, public attitude 
of uh, to to uh, about the uh, same sex marriage and uh, um, transgender rights. And basically, uh, for example, in uh, 2020, because we have passed the law in uh, 2019, in 2020, um, as for the question to uh, the same sex couples should enjoy legal rights to get married, uh, 52.5% of respondents said yes to that question. And then 2021, last year, um, the supportive rate increased to uh, 60 0.4% of respondents said yes to, uh, uh, yeah, they, they support same-sex marriage. So basically the social acceptance um, has increased, yeah. And then uh, um, even though now we can uh, get married and I have, uh, I, I get married with my same-sex partner, yeah. At, at the, on the first day that the law has been, uh, yeah, yeah, took effect. Yeah, uh, but but still, there are a lot of uh, um, differences between uh, the heterosexual uh, marriage and the same-sex marriage. For example, um, the same-sex spouses can, cannot co-adopt a child; they can only adopt a child, uh, you know, the the biological child of their spouse. Yeah, but they cannot. Um, they cannot co-adopt a child. And then for the transnational same-sex marriage, um, according to um, the interpretation of our uh, Ministry of the Interior, they said that according to, uh, you know, we, we have an act called Act Governing the Choice of Law in Civil Matters Involving Foreign Elements. Actually, that's um, international private law, yeah. It's about the choice of law, saying that um, the Article 46 say that the formation of marriage should be uh, determined by um, the national law of each party. So our government said that um, the uh, uh, we, we can only marry our same-sex partners if their uh, national law has allowed same-sex marriage. So if they come from a country where same-sex marriage has not been legalized, then uh, their marriage would not be uh, registered in Taiwan. Yeah. So um, basically, the transnational same-sex marriage are not fully allowed in Taiwan. But um, we have our legal team have um, have represented several transnational same-sex couples, and we have won several cases including um, cases between a uh, couple um, of uh, Singapore and Taiwan and which Remy has provided our legal opinion to assist the case, yeah. And also the couple between uh, of uh, Japan and uh, Taiwan and Macau, Taiwan and Malaysia, Taiwan, yeah. But, um, for, but, but, but the Ministry of Interior has not changed their legal opinion. They said that these cases are ad hoc, but this is nonsense because um, according to Article 8, uh, according to Article 8 of the uh, Act Governing the Choice of Law in Civil Matters Involving Foreign Elements, um, it said that um, if, if foreign, okay, foreign laws should not be applied if doing so leads to the violation of the public order or good morals. And uh, since our grand justices has um, said that the, um, the same-sex couples should enjoy equal rights to get married, and the same-sex marriage is basic human rights um, protected by our constitution. So basically, if foreign laws um, does not allow, um, do not allow um, same-sex marriage, then it would be, uh, it, it should be uh, deemed as violation to um, Taiwan, Taiwan's public order and good morals. And that's the reason why the Taipei High Court, High, Man, High Administrative Court, um, yeah, ruled in favor of our cases. So we are still working on the transnational um, same-sex couples marriage rights. And then, um, and basically we uh, challenge also to uh, the uh, binary uh, gender concept. You know, um, 
in Taiwan, um, we have only uh, male and female um, legal gender. So we are considering to uh, introduce um, third gender options for non-binary people. And, and also um, it is allowed for a transgender citizen to change gender marker on, under Taiwan's current system in condition that they have to do the uh, bottom surgery. We think that um, this should be optional. If a transgender person want to do the surgery, they can do so and should be uh, supportive. But if they don't want to do that, they still uh, have the right to uh, you know, self-determine of their gender marker. Yeah, so we have um, represented a uh, transgender woman last year to win the first case in Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's high court. And uh, she, she, she is a uh, transgender woman. She uh, was the first one to uh, uh, change her legal gender without uh, providing proof of a bottom surgery, yeah. And then uh, we have represented other transgender people um, for to, to abolish, yeah, to file um, petitions and delegations to trying to uh, abolish the compulsory uh, requirement of surgery for a uh, change of gender marker. Uh, and yes, yeah, one of the uh, court has sus suspended the, the case and uh, sent our case to a constitutional court. So uh, we are waiting for um, the court hearing probably uh, next year. Um, yeah, we expect that the constitutional court would um, uh, decide that the uh, compulsory surgery requirement is unconstitutional. Yeah, and uh, I would like to uh, share some of the um, stories um, with you that uh, in Taiwan, um, I think that, uh, you know, from the very beginning, I, I uh, come back to Taiwan from France in uh, 2009, at the very first beginning that even the uh, LGBT community um, don't put the marriage equality as the priority to promote um, this issue, yeah. And then, uh, through the uh, systematical um, efforts and uh, campaign that um, it became the consensus um, of the community to uh, push forward for this um, issue, yeah. So I think that um, each society has um, their own context and their agenda, yeah. And I believe that all those issues are connected and uh, we should help each other and uh, share the uh, experiences. And uh, yeah, um, fortunately, um, homosexuality has never been uh, criminalized in Taiwan. Yeah, so um, we are lucky. Yeah, so we don't have 377A yeah, to, to, to repeal. Yeah, and, uh, and also we have already um, the uh, anti-discrimination law uh, for employment and for education. So that um, led a uh, relatively uh, fa favorable um, atmosphere to legalize um, same-sex marriage. And also I think that um, the, um, because we have um, democracy, so, um, we, we can lobby different political parties that create some kind of a competition for them to, uh, you know, to make progress um, towards LGBT issues. That would be uh, uh, yeah, a, a factor too, yeah. Because in, uh, in 2013, DPP, the, the Demo Democratic Progress Party um, was the, probably the only part, political party to support uh, gay rights, but even though uh, they have only uh, minority uh, parliament members to support our bill. And then uh, to uh, 2016, there are um, several different political parties, including the conservative party, the Kuomintang, and, uh, um, and, and other uh, small parties to support uh, same-sex marriage bill. Yeah, so um, things changed. And uh, if we don't uh, give up, then uh, we can, uh, yeah, we can make our dreams come true. And uh, yeah, 
So keep fighting. <laughs> okay. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great uh, message to uh, <laughs> to end the formal presentations. Keep fighting. <laughs> uh, it's, it's an international universal lesson. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much, uh, You're Victoria. welcome. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so now we have uh, time for um, questions and answers um, and discussions. And uh, I just saw a very nice comment. Uh, good job, everyone. Thank you for all you do. Um, and so um, uh, great. And thank, I, I echo that. And uh, but let's I, I know we have a already have a question in the chat. And um, uh, Marion, would you like to ask it directly, or would you uh, like me to uh, go ahead and summarize it? Um, and uh, uh, why don't I start by summarizing it? Because uh, it was something that I was very interested in also. Uh, it, it, uh, and this is for Remy and Swang. Um, it was very interesting the what you pointed to uh, as for the sort of contradictory uh, polling information about especially young people and the lack of clarity about um, what was uh, their their views on marriage equality um, and uh, uh, and Marion's question also referenced similar situations in Japan um, uh, about lack of clarity of. The importance of some of the issues. So I think, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to hear from uh, either or both of you about what is going on in Singapore right now um, to try to address that. And, um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is a little bit of a tricky constitutional amendment because it doesn't outright ban same-sex marriage. It says it's left to the legislature. So it cuts off the court's ability. So it really cuts off this key aspect to be able to challenge the constitutionality of the ban and leaves it to the democratic uh, legislative process. But yeah, I'd love to hear what is the strategy uh, that uh, the community is going forward with to uh, quickly change opinions and uh, educate uh, the community, the broader community. Uh, yeah, so um, maybe I'll start. Uh, there are many, many balls in the air at the moment. Um, and let me just situate the answer against the backdrop of what the government is communicating to the community uh, and what the opponents of equality are communicating to the government. Uh, so from the perspective of the government, uh, repealing 377A was taking a political hit with uh, their more conservative base of supporters. Older voters who are more likely to support the ruling party uh, as they have since independence, uh, a lot of them uh, are uh, socially conservative. A lot of them are religious. Uh, and what has happened in the run-up to 377A was a large campaign on the part of the government to try and shift the goalpost uh, to explain uh, why 377A uh, has to be uh, repealed. And the very strange and weird explanation the government has come up for repealing 377A in communicating that to their base uh, has got nothing to do with equality or has got nothing to do with equal rights. The weird explanation that they have given their uh, uh, conservative supporters is if we do not repeal 377A through parliament, the judiciary or the courts and these naughty lawyers will eventually get the courts to strike down 377A and after that, get the Singapore courts to make uh, marriage uh, equality between gay people a reality through the judicial process and not through the legislative process. So what the government has done is it's drawn a line between uh, or it's made it an issue of democratic legitimacy, 
meaning uh, how do we get to equality? Is it through the courts or is it through parliament? Okay, so that's how they've justified this to their base. On the part of the community, uh, we are um, uh, trying to hold the line against a lot of the backlash that is coming from conservatives who are very angry at the repeal. Because this argument or this explanation from the government is barely convincing to anyone who, uh, who is thinking this through. Right? If you want to repeal because it's the correct thing to do, uh, you should just say so. Okay, uh, And to be fair, in some messaging, they have suggested that that's part of their motivation. Uh, so it's, um, uh, and, and the other thing that the community is having to message around uh, is not uh, having the battle on marriage equality uh, today. Uh, because if we were to have that uh, battle today, we would lose it uh, because of uh, the numbers. Uh, it, it's not it's not a question that is before Parliament, and it's not a question uh, that we I think are ready to fully engage in yet. Uh, so I don't have uh, an answer uh, for you, John, uh, about how best to deal with it. Uh, I think everyone is in a bit of a suspended uh, holding pattern because the repeal bill goes to parliament, I think actually tomorrow. I think first reading is tomorrow. The constitutional amendment, uh, we know what it is not going to be. It's not going to enshrine the definition specifically in the constitution, but it's going to say that the definition of marriage in uh, marriage law, which is the women's charter, cannot be challenged in the courts. And that seems to leave open the door for it being eventually changed by way of uh, parliamentary procedure or through uh, more uh, broader societal pressures and campaign that could lead to legislative change. Uh, so um, I think it's really a process of uh, uh, trying to game out how we react to the constitutional amendments that are coming uh, and then really uh, building the uh, foundations for the uh, battle for the next 10, 20, or 30 years towards, towards marriage equality. Uh, and then at the same time, trying to uh, get some of the lower hanging fruit that should be more obvious, like uh, workplace discrimination, legislation, equal protection uh, in, in schools, anti-bullying, and media representation. Great. Um, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I think it really, uh, what, you, what you said underscores something that I think in all the places represented on this uh, webinar that we've experienced these same sort of things where we've hit a roadblock <laughs> and there's an element of patience, but uh, keeping uh, the advocacy going uh, anywhere that it is possible. Um, and uh, Overall, we're going to win, <laughs> and we want to do that as fast as possible, of course, and there are obstacles to that. So um, I think we have a couple other questions, too, coming in, and uh, one was, and as I said in the chat, you can now um, uh, unmute yourselves. Please raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask yourself orally, but I'll just uh, read the ones that we're getting in the chat. And one of the questions is uh, to everybody, have you faced any threats or harassment uh, yourself personally um, uh, because of the LGBT advocacy that you have been doing? And uh, actually maybe uh, if uh, Peng and Yang, you want to uh, just offer a few uh, insights too about you know, uh, it, it's extraordinary. Um, we know so many uh, amazing Chinese activists and their tenacity and bravery in the front of some very difficult circumstances sometimes. Um, and if you want to uh, make any comment yourselves on uh, personally how you have sustained yourself uh, through um, difficult periods, uh, including right now. 
Um, but any comment you might want to make about that, anybody could share also uh, any harassment or uh, what you have ex you've experienced. Let me go first. Yes. Great. Yeah. Uh, there are two kinds of stress or harass. Uh, one is from the authority, the government body, police will, especially during the past two years, uh, they are trying to stop all kinds of organizing or mobilizing. So not only us, but also different uh, activists or organizer in the movement will be like regularly checked or any kinds of events will be stopped by the local police. So uh, it, for the activists will face a lot of uh, 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 psychological, mentally, mentally uh, uh, threatened or, or, or kinds of uh, pressure. Uh, but in the other side, uh, related to the previous question so from the internet, like young people or including young people or other there are many people on internet they are trying to use uh, a more nationalism or or kind of narrative to uh, criticize the movement like if you speak out loudly or if you work with like international uh, organizations they will uh, like they, they will say, oh, we all support LGBT or gay friends, but you can't speak too loud or you can't work with Western organizations, <laughs> something like that. So um, even among young people, they were stated uh, on the internet and a lot of uh, uh, speak out loud on, uh, against LGBT movement, yeah. Great, thank you. Yang, did you want to share something too? Uh, yes, I yeah, I thought Ian Ian's gave a very good answers to the questions, and also, but there's one thing that I would like to add here. So sometimes I think when we do advocacy work in China, we face a lot of pressures, not only from the authorities, but sometimes from our community, because as Victoria mentioned, that many active LGBT activists they don't make don't think that marriage is something that we should put so many energy and time that to that dedicated to that because they thought like marriage is something that is is going to die in the 21st century. But for, so, so what we do a lot about do a lot of litigations about same sex protections or same sex marriage, we receive a lot of criticism from the of community, from the movement, uh, from the internet. But what do you feel is like sometimes? You, you never that you just just as I thought it's just normal because sometimes you have to learn that how to be smart to convince anybody that your work is worth worthy and you have to be very smart to convince that everybody that even they don't agree with you but what kind of strategy is that we can use to approach them to convince them okay there's something very important we wish to work together so in that way like we do receive that pressure but it's also give us some opportunity to push ourselves to become smart, to work with diverse stakeholders. Great, thank you. Victoria? Yeah, um, only for the very beginning. Yeah, I mean, uh, 13 years ago, when we started our campaign for marriage equality, I received some, um, you know, strange uh, message like I hope your child will be uh, homosexual things like that and I think that would be great yeah <laughs> first of all I, I can have a child and then uh, he is or she is homosexual and that would be fine for me yeah and but basically I think Taiwan is really some yeah to to a uh, in a sense, Taiwan is a uh, really free society so um, the anti-gay churches will attack us through some you know um mis uh, disinformation yeah but basically um no um serious harassment or um yeah or threat yeah but but sometimes we will feel um 
upset, of course, because um, they might say things very insulting, yeah, or, uh, you know, so, but, but this is the process, you know, that they are um, ignorance and, uh, yeah, with prejudice. That's why they, um, why, why they are mean people, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so I, I think it's, it's basically fine, yeah, in Taiwan, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Remy. Uh, so uh, the funny thing is, when I first start, when I first did the first set of constitutional challenges in 2013, uh, I was not out. Um, but uh, by the time I did the second set in 2019, uh, I was out. Uh, what happened in between uh, was in 2016, uh, I was outed. Um, so what happened was. Uh, I was actually on holiday in 2016 with my boyfriend and um, a family member calls me. Uh, it's my aunt who I live with. Um, and she said, have you seen this website about you? And I said, what website? And uh, what had happened was someone had uh, taken video footage of me kissing someone outside a bar in Singapore uploaded that to a, a porn website, Pornhub, uh, and then had started a Blogspot uh, website uh, with that video as well as other posts uh, about me being a closeted homosexual. Uh, it also included uh, photos from my father's and my aunt's LinkedIn pages uh, and family photos from... Uh, my birthday dinners with my family. Uh, and it also included my home address. And just to make sure that my uh, family uh, uh, got the um, information, they had printed out uh, printouts from the website and snail mailed it to my home address. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, so that was December 2016. Uh, and... Fortunately, when I came back, uh, and my aunt's uh, Anglican, uh, her partner, husband is um, uh, a missionary. Uh, I was really worried when I came back and uh, from that trip. Um, and uh, the first thing she told me when I got back was, why don't you invite your partner for uh, Christmas? Um, awesome. <laughs> and... That was just, it was amazing. I was, I was 30 years old uh, in 2016. Uh, and that really brought home to me how a lot of the impact of laws like 377A, even if they're not enforced, or the impact of social stigma is, uh, you know, and it's difficult to explain to people who don't face it. Um, it's not that you're afraid of going to jail uh, immediately or tomorrow. Uh, it's these prisons we create in our own heads around ourselves. Uh, um, even when uh, the only thing we have to be afraid of is uh, the shadows, uh, is our own shadow, right? Uh, metaphorically and, you know, sometimes almost literally. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm so lucky I was able to get past that because I'm legally trained, I've got resources, I've got people I could call, things I could do. Uh, it was extremely difficult, uh, but I mean, it's nothing compared to what a lot of uh, other uh, gay people struggle with uh, in Singapore, in China, in Taiwan, uh, around the world. I think it really just highlights how much more work there is to be done, uh, even if... Uh, laws are changing, society is changing. Uh, there's so much invisibility that we inflict on ourselves and on each other. Thank you very much to everybody um, for, because you're really showing how this deeply affects us personally as advocates and professionals uh, working in this field. Um, and uh, we have a couple more questions I want to get to. Um, and one question, um, uh, is about uh, COVID and uh, how COVID has impacted or affected the LGBTQ uh, plus movement in your country, or uh, you know, has it caused problems or has it actually brought unexpected opportunities uh, or progress? 
And I want to just combine that because we're, we are coming up to the beginning of the hour here and when we'll have to stop is that uh, combined another person asked uh, that they were curious about businesses involvement in advancing and hindering marriage equality and gender equality in your countries. Uh, and if there are any particular business influences on LGBTQ rights that you think are unique to your countries or to Asian countries uh, in general. So uh, I'll put out both of those questions, uh, both about business and about uh, COVID. Um, if um, uh, anybody would like to respond uh, in your particular country. Okay, Victoria. Of course. Yeah. Okay. I Oh, sorry. Uh, as for oh sorry sorry okay I, I will do it very quick yeah um basically the the pandemic influenced our um sem transnational same sex couples yeah since they cannot um get married in Taiwan and then uh, so they they some of them um cannot um see each other for a long time yeah more than two years yeah that's very uh yeah um Tra tragic yeah and uh and also um at the beginning of the pandemic um the 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 substantial gathering in public space would be uh, restricted but uh, generally speaking um yeah the restriction are loosened and uh we still will have our gay pride parade um at the end of this month october and also trans parade so um, the general situation is fine, yeah. Great, thank you. Swang, did you want to comment? Oh, I was just saying that the uh, pink dot, which is the most uh, visible, um, I, I would say, uh, advocacy in Singapore, where, because essentially in Singapore, again, I was quite amazed just now when I saw that uh, the, uh, for China, you could, you could even uh, do demonstrations in front of the court. Uh, in Singapore, public assembly is extremely restricted and uh, uh, confined to uh, really assemblies without advanced permits are confined to this uh, little field in the middle of the city. And uh, so Pink Dot was, the, is this annual, uh, you say demonstration, but it became like celebration or advocacy uh, that happens every year. And uh, where all uh, LGBT and LGBT supporters uh, gather on at the park to uh, celebrate uh, LGBT rights and, and advocate for LGBT rights, uh, it gained. Uh, it started very small, but then in 2009, it gained a lot of traction over the years because of uh, because a lot of the in multi uh, international companies started to sponsor, started to support, and started to make their pre uh, have presences there. Like they started setting up booths at, at the uh, pin dot event uh, until the until uh, uh, government uh, passed the law in 2017 i believe saying that moving forward uh, when it comes to uh, demonstrations at that park uh, foreign organizations and foreign citizens will not be allowed to to do that uh, but what uh, what then happened was very heartening because uh, then one uh, singapore based property agency uh, set up this movement called uh, red dot red dot for pink dot okay because red dot is uh, singapore is a red dot so red dot for pink dot and to galvanize singapore uh, businesses to sponsor and support the event and that uh, and that became quite a quite successful and it has now become a, a major feature at every pink dot event so yes, I think businesses uh, do play quite a uh, important role. Great, thank you, Swang. Um, and um, as we're coming up on the end of the hour, um, uh, that uh, if uh, if uh, the speakers would please um, uh, put in uh, their contact information if they can be contacted directly with people who want to get more involved. Uh, and learn more or websites. Uh, and uh, I will do that with mine. But we have one final question too that came in about uh, how can we build a stronger LGBTI solidarity uh, in Asia under the political realities of different countries? And 
I hope this uh, event this morning or this evening in the East Coast of the United States is one small element uh, contributing to that. But if anybody here, uh, and just as Swan was saying, it's about building solidarity um, uh, together in Singapore. But if anybody has a concluding comment they would like to make about, is there an, is there an Asian organization that people can go to? Is there anything that is not just about a single country, but uh, bringing people together across the many different countries in Asia? Uh, yeah, uh, besides that, I would like to comment on this question that I think telling the um, uh, Asian story is quite important, at least for China, <laughs> or, or I think I believe for many uh, uh, Asian countries, because uh, there are many governments in Asia, can, Asian country, they always say it's a, LGBT is a Western value. So I think it's necessary to uh, tell story in Asia. Like I was in the business uh, summit, like workplace summit this room today, tell about talking about the uh, business in Asia, how to support in Asian country, the diversity inclusion, how it impact to the uh, LGBT employees. So I think this kind of story like, uh, it, uh, how uh, the example of or possibility that business in Asia or like how other Asian country works, like when Taiwan uh, legalized same-sex marriage, it encouraged activists at least uh, an LGBT community in China a lot. And we also showing that in Asian cultural society, it works, right? So I think if we can work together to tell more story or, or, or under the narrative of Asian culture, I think it will be better for uh, the movement locally. Yeah. May, yeah, sure. may I just add one more thing? Yeah, remember our client, Mr. Qi Jiawei petitioned the government um, to legalize same-sex marriage in 1986. And Holland as the first country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage in 2001. So you know that same-sex marriage is not a Western concept. Yeah. <laughs> and Taiwan's constitutional decision that Victoria and her team brought about is actually more progressive than the United States Supreme Court decision. Um, so um, we always highlight <laughs> that Asia is actually ahead of the United States when it comes to constitutional rights. Uh, um, so, um, all right, well, we're at the top of the hour now, um, and Robert, I assume we should uh, finish up here. Um, um, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for organizing this. Thank you to all the speakers, and uh, also thanks, of course, to the participants. Uh, we've recorded this and at one point we'll put it on our website and if you have questions uh, I've put my email on the in the chat box and we're very easy to reach but again thank you to everyone for taking the time and for making the effort to organize this and thank you Robert very much and everybody at Temple University and uh, thank you to uh, our friends and uh, speakers. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your being here uh, with us today. And of course, truly appreciate everything you're doing uh, for, for all of us um, across this world, especially in Asia. So um, yes, till we meet again. Thank you very thank you. much, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. for having us. Bye-bye. Have See a you. nice day. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.